All right, the Zoom room is filling up. As always, we invite you to tell us who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. Uh, tell us your Penn State class year. We have a great special edition of Football Letter Live for you today. Uh, we are going to be talking with Matt McGloin. In just a couple of minutes, uh, it's good to see some familiar names. I see Kevin Lashane and Russ Mitchell and John Hess joining us for this uh, special time, special Thanksgiving edition of Football Letter Live. We look forward to a great conversation coming up in just a moment or two with Matt McGloin. I see Elaine Graham Miller. Good to see you, Graham. And Lynn Marie DiCarlo from New Milford, New Jersey. Uh, a parent that tunes in on a regular basis to Football Letter Live. And Paul Schallenberger from Glen Burnie, Maryland, class of 87. I see another one of his classmates up there, John Hess, class of 87. So class of 87, well represented here. And Maury Hendler from Sands Point, Long Island, uh, active with our Long Island chapter there. Russ Mitchell, we're still undefeated second in the half. second half. Yes. That's great. Dave Snyder down in North Carolina. Which part of North Carolina are you tuning in from today, Dave? We lived in Greenville, North Carolina for 10 years. Oh, Statesville, out in the western part there, north of north of Charlotte. Kind of uh west of Greensboro, Winston-Salem area. Well, thanks for, thanks for zooming in with us. We got a great program that we will get just started in just a moment or two. Matt McGloin is with us. We're going to talk uh, to him about his career as a Penn State Nittany Lion and hear what he's doing afterwards. Just down the road from Dave Snyder in Statesville is Jim Delark from the class of 66. Jim, thanks for joining us down there in, in Charlotte. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I want to welcome you to a special Thanksgiving week edition of Football Letter Live. Today, we welcome Penn State football letterman Matt McGloin, who will discuss his time at Penn State, the inspiring 2012 season, and much, much more. We're encouraging you to share your questions for our guest today. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar or ask questions in the comments. For those of you who are tuning in on Facebook Live, uh, you can put your questions in the comments. We'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions for our guest today. I'm joined as always by the legendary editor of the Football Letter, John Black. John, how are you today? I'm fine on this uh, beautiful sunny day in State College. Uh, Paul, it's great to be with you again here today. Today. Absolutely. Gorgeous day here in Happy Valley. Looking forward to getting out on the house a little bit, get some fresh air. Right. Uh, there's not too many days like this left in the year, so we should take advantage of those. We got to make the best of while we can. Absolutely. John, let's talk some football looking ahead to Saturday's game against Michigan. What are some of your keys to the game? Well, I tell you, you know, it's going to be a, a big challenge out in Ann Arbor, as it always is. Uh, Coach James Franklin, who's brought a lot of victories to Penn State, uh, one place he's never gotten one yet is in Ann Arbor. But uh, I'm sure he'd love to get it out there on, on Saturday. Uh, it looked to me a little bit like uh, Michigan's getting back on track again here after, after you know, 
two marquee teams in the Big Ten <laughs> have been suffering, struggling this right. year. Uh, and uh, the fans are getting a little excited about it. But uh, Michigan certainly started to get back on track uh, Saturday night at, uh, at Rutgers. And I think they uh, probably resolved their quarterback question there. Uh, Cade Miranda came in and took over and uh, drove uh, the Wolverines a, a big comeback uh, win in overtime with four touchdown passes. Uh, they've got a very speedy uh, kick returner and wide receiver in Giles Jackson, returned a kickoff for 97 yards, got open uh, deep behind the Rutgers secondary. And uh, Michigan has worked out a good rotation of running backs like uh, Penn State thought that they had back before the start of the season, but before uh, all the entries right. that took place. But uh, the Michigan defense has not really been performing like a typical Don Brown defense. Uh, and the head coach, Jim Harbaugh, is under a lot of pressure uh, from their fans. But uh, I think uh, in the final analysis on Saturday, it's going to be decided in the trenches. And whoever can control the line of scrimmage is most likely going to win that game in Ann Arbor on Saturday. Well, John, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Wouldn't it, it would be it would be kind of quintessential 2020 for James Franklin to get his first win in Ann Arbor uh, yeah. in, in this season. So yeah. I hope he brings Perfect. home the win. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, it would be. Rutgers had them on the ropes. I, I watched that mm. game, but then, you know, as good, as improved as Rutgers is this year, and you can tell Coach Ciano has right. them going in the right direction. Rutgers still does Rutgers things. They they have a kicker from the soccer team. They miss a field goal. They yeah. let up the the kick return, and so um, so so we'll see. But there is not uh, there is not a easy game left on Penn State's schedule based on how we have performed so far this year. Let's hope we get it back on track in Ann Arbor. Yeah, these these a lot of these teams that have uh, typically been back in the in the pack in the Big Ten. Are having a, a lot of fun this this year. Uh, Rutgers and Maryland and uh, Northwestern making a big turnaround this year and having a grand, fantastic season. And uh, well, things are just so very different this this season. It's uh, an not definitely an anomaly. Yeah, you you don't know what you're going to get, right? Are you going to get the Michigan State team that lost terribly to Rutgers or the one that beat Michigan, right? Exactly. Or, exactly. And so. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's football in, in the 2020 season. And look, we're, we're just going to remain positive and try to uh, finish out the season, finish out the season strong. You know, when, when you face adversity like this team has um, your true character starts to show uh, with, with how you react to adversity. And when I think about somebody who has reacted to adversity, I right. think it's our next guest, right? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Matt McGloin was uh, Penn State's quarterback from 2009 through 2012, helped lead the 2012 team to an 8-4 and four mark during Bill O'Brien's first year. He was a former walk-on quarterback uh, to start uh, for Joe Paterno. He was the first former walk-on to start for Coach Paterno. He threw a career-high four touchdowns during Paterno's 400th win a home victory over Northwestern, played four seasons with Oakland in the NFL, starting 13 games and throwing 11 touchdowns. He now hosts the Underrated Hour podcast. Please welcome Matt, Majoin, Matt McGloin to Football Letter Live. Matt, how are you? Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. You're looking, looking super. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> trying to stay in shape. So Matt, uh, your your path to Penn State um, as a as a touted football player coming out of of Scranton, uh, your path to Penn State was a little different than uh, than other quarterbacks who have come here to go on to start for the Nittany Lions. Take us through kind of your decision making process. You were you were sought after by a number of schools. You were recruited by a number of schools at different levels to play football. But how did you how did you land on Penn State? Right. Yeah. I mean, I was a three sport athlete in high school. I played baseball, basketball, football um, and, you know, football just kind of took over for me. Um, it just kind of seemed like that was where, you know, uh, my future was going to be. Um, you know, I felt like I can, you know, play 
you know, at a high level, I, I had a, you know, my team, we had a successful, you know, high school career. You know, we were one of the top ranked teams in the state. You know, we lost in the state playoffs. We had a couple of guys on our team um, that got division one offers, went on to play division one football. But, you know, unfortunately I couldn't get a division one offer. I, I was recruited by, you know, a lot of schools at the one a level and, you know, one double a, but I just couldn't get a division one offer. And I knew that, you know, that I had the work ethic. I had the drive, the determination. I knew I had the ability to play at the highest of levels. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play on ABC. I wanted to play on ESPN. I wanted to play in those games that I grew up watching. Right. Um, and, you know, again, nothing. And I, I've said this, you know, in interviews before there's, listen, there's nothing against playing at the division two or the division, you know, one double a level, but I didn't want to play in front of, 800 or a thousand people every week. You know, I wanted to play in front of 75,000. I wanted to play in front of 110,000 people. That's what I wanted. Um, in right. Penn state, I was fortunate enough to get a preferred walk on at Penn state. Um, and I took that opportunity and I made the most of it. Absolutely. You certainly did, uh, Matt. That was uh, just a show of how about a, a person who has the uh, confidence and the uh, drive and the motivation can uh, do good, do great things. I mean, the fact that uh, you started here as a walk-on, wound up as the winner of the Burlesworth Trophy, as the outstanding uh, player, former walk-on who took over and did an outstanding job uh, with his team. I, that that that's kind of the ultimate. I have a lot more respect for that really than the Heisman Trophy because it's somebody who really got there by their work ethic and their uh, drive and their uh, unwillingness to give up. Uh, when, when would you say was the time that, uh, at, at what point in time did it become clear to you that uh, Penn State would be the right place for you and maybe you could uh, really make it? Uh, a yeah. Um, yeah, well, it was really the only option I had, <laughs> you know, to play at the highest of the levels. Uh, you know, the, the division one level. And, you know, fortunately for me, it was two hours from my home. Um, and like I said, you know, there's like, they're like, Hey, listen, we want you to be preferred walk on, uh, be a part of this team. You won't be on scholarship. Um, so, and I didn't know what it meant, but you know, like I said, they wanted me to be a part of that team and you became you know, a said, great part of it. I said, and I, yeah. And I said, yes. And for me, you know, I'm a realist, you know, I, listen, I knew early on that things were going to be tough and you know, preferred walk-ons. I'm not even sure people knew I was a part of the team early on, you know, in those early summer conditioning drills and training camps and things like that. Um, but one thing that I wanted to do when I got, when I first got on campus, I wanted to earn the, the respect of the people around me, earn respect from my coaches, earn respect from my teammates, uh, respect from the strength and conditioning guys in the weight room. And I, I did that by working hard every single day in the film room, on the practice field, in the weight room. Um, right taking advantage of, if, you know, there'd be days where I wouldn't get any reps versus a defense in a seven on seven or a team drill early on. You know, I may get a few throws and one-on-one -on -one drills or anything like that, but I made sure that I made the most of those reps and the most of those opportunities so that, you know, everybody that was watching was like, you know what, this kid can throw the football a little bit. This kid has a little bit of potential. And, you know, for me, John, it's about consistency. Um, and what I mean by that is about being the same person every single day, showing up and working hard every single day. Um, you know, understanding that, um, you know, I needed an edge. And what I mean by that is that I wasn't a four-star recruit. I wasn't a five-star recruit. I didn't have 40 offers. So my edge was that you knew you were going to get hundred percent out of me every day. You know, I was going to work harder than everybody around me. Um, I was going to be prepared. I was going to understand the playbook. I was going to understand, you know, the, the, the practice script for the day. Um, you know, I was under, I was going to understand the playbook so that when you put me into a situation, I was going to be comfortable. Um, and that I was going to perform well and that you can trust me. And I, I mentioned consistency because a lot of guys can't do that, especially at the quarterback position. You know, guys, you know, from the ages of 18 to 23, you know, playing Division One football, you're asking a lot out of these players. And a lot of guys just can't do it, you know. And uh, some of these guys that uh, have come through Penn State have all the talent in the world, but they just can't put it together. They can't be the same person every single day. Um, so you're the me, and again, from, you know, this is the last thing I'll say on it and we, and we can move on. But for me, that was, you know, it was tough, obviously. But again, that's what I had to do to succeed. I knew I had to be that same person every day. 
Well, you're the poster boy for the hard work ethic and the drive and the uh, belief in yourself and the confidence to take it all the way that you can. Appreciate it. Thank you. So Matt, I've referenced adversity, right? And and there's there's adversity of being the the walk on, right? Trying to just get everyone to know that you're you're on the team and that you you belong there in a in a really crowded quarterback room, right? And so there's the adversity of trying to move up that depth chart, trying to get the reps in practice, trying to get onto the field. But then there's also adversity that we faced in in 2011. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that time and how you stepped up as a leader for that team? We couldn't turn the television on without seeing you and Zordich and Maudi uh, kind of leading the team and kind of rallying everybody around, you know, this is what Penn State football is. Talk about how you uh, overcame that adversity. Right. Yeah. Um, so listen, the thing about that team, the team we had heading into the 2012 season um, that team consisted of, of good players, but I think more importantly, it consisted of great people. And I think that's one of the reasons why we were able to stay together as a unit, stay together as a team and continue to march forward, continue to push forward. Now we understood it was more, you know, than football. You know, we knew we were playing for universities past, present and future. Um, and the way that our alumni has had rallied around us, uh, you know, current, uh, students, former students, um, our families, former players, um, just kind of the way everybody at Penn State rallied around us and supported us. I don't think that happens anywhere else, you know, throughout the nation when it comes to football, that support we received every single day. Um, and it was us. It was an us, us against the world mentality. Um, you know, and that was, a, again, that, that 2012 season, you know, we, we, we accepted that responsibility. Um, you know, again, we knew what we were playing for. We understood what we were playing for. You know, I think we were players and, and people at the time that, that were kind of wise beyond our years. Um, you know, and again, it, it, that, listen, having Bill O'Brien there um, was probably the only man um, at the time that can do what he did with Penn State football. Having, and a guy I don't think gets enough credit is Craig Fitzgerald, our head strength and conditioning coach at the time. Because you got to remember during the whole entire summer, that, that's really one of the only coaches that you're working with every single day. So the right. way he was able to break us down and build us back up, um, you know, we really came together as a team during that uh, 2012 summer with our conditioning programs and our strength programs. Um, so, yeah, it, listen, that, I mean, again, for how tough that year was, the support we had was the reason why we were able to do that. Well, Matt, I mean – the, the, the eyes of the entire college uh, football world were upon Penn State. And as you talked about the support that you got, I mean, did you sense that on a daily basis in the, in the routines of going to class, going to practice, the workouts? I mean, did you feel that support uh, from the entire Penn State community behind you? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, week in and week out, you know, we have River John, we started on too, <laughs> you know, and uh you know, that was, that was obviously tough, but for us, it was really one game at a time because we had no chance at a big 10 championship. We had no chance at going to a bowl game. So you, you literally to... as a fifth year senior can look at the calendar and say, I have X amount of days left to wear this Penn state helmet, to put this Penn state Jersey on. And, you know, I think that's what, one of the reasons why, you know, we were able to really just be there every single day and enjoy every single day. We enjoyed lifting and listen, nobody likes lifting. <laughs> nobody likes working out. I mean, we enjoy practice. <laughs> if, a fo if a football player tells you he likes practice, he's lying. You yeah. know, uh, it's practice is tough. Lifting stuff, conditioning stuff, but we enjoyed it. We loved competing. Um, you know, we love being around one another on the practice field and in the weight room and in meetings, you know, we had fun. Um, it was just, you know, it, it was, I mean, again, probably one of the best years I've had playing the game of football. Um, and and you, again, inspired, you inspired all Penn Staters. Thank you. Yeah, and again, mentioning 0-2, it was, I don't think there was any point in time during that 0-2 start where, you know, there we weren't pointing fingers. We weren't saying, well, this is why we're losing. This is why we're not losing. It was, no. it was just like, you know, we knew the type of team we were. We just had to continue to push forward to continue to march forward. Um, and again, the support never went anywhere you know yeah. we even went all into the five you know 
five game win streak to win eight of eight of our last 10, the support never went anywhere. And again, that was really, really helpful for us. And, you know, I don't know if that's been said enough over the years. Um, but uh, again, that again, Penn state having our back was, uh, you know, one of the most important things we needed. You guys got us on the road to recovery in perfect uh, unison there. Well, I, I think that's the thing about adversity, right? You guys liked lifting. You liked practice. You liked being in the film room because you had faced bigger things, right? You you had faced bigger things as a team just to get away from all of those distractions that were happening outside of those places probably made you all appreciate being in those places, right? But where you say a football player doesn't like, you know, what the, if the, if the, if they tell you they like practice, they're lying, right? <laughs> you guys had a different appreciation for practice because there might not have been practice at, at one point, right? So, um, so I think it's probably that appreciation of having faced other things to get to that season that was probably a real difference. You guys grew up a lot in the in that off season to appreciate probably more than most college football teams get the opportunity to appreciate some of those little things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. You know, yeah, we, you know, it was just a, uh, yeah, it was a special year for us as a football team. Um, and it was know, a special and, year for Penn State. And I meant, and you know, when I mentioned, you know, we had good players, but great people, yeah. you know, one of the reasons why we were able to have success that year is because everybody on that team accepted their role, big or small. And for a, a football program to have players like that, players that were selfless, you know, uh, it doesn't come around that often. You know, you didn't have guys complaining they weren't getting catches. You didn't have guys complaining they weren't getting carries. Um, you, know, you didn't have guys complaining that all they were doing was playing special teams and they weren't playing offense and defense. Um, you know, everybody wanted to be a part of that season and a part of each game. And, you know, everybody wanted to help out in whatever way that they could. I mean, we had guys that, you know, never played, but went as hard as they possibly could in practice because they were helping us get better during the week and preparing for a game. You know, that's what makes a team. That's what makes a team so special. And, you know, when you look back on it and I still get mad over it, we could have won 10 or 11 games, which, yeah. which is crazy, oh, yeah. you know, but, uh, but yeah, again, listen, the eight and four record, obviously, I mean, I don't think was, you know, indicative of, you know, the type of season that it was or the type of team that we had. Uh, it's the closest 12 and all as I've ever felt. Well, you, you talked about that uh, 0 and 2 start. Uh, tell us what it was like that trip back from Virginia and then in practice that following week. And how did you really make that turnaround that uh, led to uh, eight wins in the next uh, 10 games? Yeah, well, first, listen, when you know you're struggling early on and you know you're 0-2 or even Penn, look at Penn State's team this year being 0-5, you know, you don't need to say anything to anybody because you know you're not winning. You know you're losing football right. games, right? You know, the players know that, the coaches know that. So it's, you know, what are you going to do? You know, I think it's when you're struggling early on, you know, there's one of two ways you can go. You can continue to lose or you can say, all right, we need to make some changes. We need to push forward. We cannot lose anymore. What's the problem? We need to correct this problem. You know, what have we done well these first two weeks of the season? What haven't we done well? And then I think that's where you say, all right, well, we need to push forward with the things that we're doing well and the stuff that we're not good at or the stuff that we need more time with. Okay, maybe we can implement that into practice a little bit as we get going here. But this is what this team's really good at. And one of the things I thought Bill O'Brien did a fantastic job of, especially with me, is that you know, he called plays that he knew I liked. He called plays that he knew that I was going to have some success with, plays that I trusted, plays that I was comfortable with. And, you know, he gave me – and for only understanding the offense for, you know, less than a year, um, you know, he really was like, listen, I'm going to call the play, but, you know, it's your job to get us into a good play. And I think that relationship and that communication between – the person that calls the plays and the quarterback is more important than anything, because at the end of the day, you know, the coach isn't out there. It's the players that are out there, you know, making the play successful and understanding what the coverage is and, you know, what the defense is and, and, and doing your best to, to get your team into a good execution play. And last thing, yeah. Last thing on the 0 and two start, I think it's, 
you know, when you're faced with that, and I mentioned one of two ways can go, the other way can be, listen, you know, you find out who you are as a player, you find out who you are as a person, you find out what your team's made of, what your teammates are made of, you find out what your coaches are made out of at that point, because are you giving up on me or are we still working? You know, are you still motivating one another? Are you still um, showing up every day and coaching us well? Are we still showing up every day and working hard? Um, and listen, you know, again, and even to talk about Penn State started 0-5, I know there's not 100,000 people in the stands anymore, but this is a game where you need to self-motivate. And at that time, when we were 0-2, that's what we needed to do, self-motivate. We needed to still show up every day um, and work as hard as we could. And again, that's the type of team we were. We weren't going to, you know, lie down and, and, and let the season go to waste. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, a lot, we had tough, tough players, a lot of tough players. No. Oh. So you got things turned around, right? 0-2. Uh, and then as the season went along, the win at Iowa was perhaps maybe the biggest indicator that the team was going to finish strong. Kinnick Stadium, one of the toughest places in the country to play. Um, the team wins. You go out there and you put a hurt on Iowa, win by 24, probably the best game all season. You had a great game. Uh, for you, did it feel just like another win or, did, or was there something special about that 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 was going to propel you through the rest of the season? You know, it was kind of, for me, it was one of those moments where it was like, you know, we, we got a pretty goddamn good football team. <laughs> and the other moment was kind of like, damn, I wish we didn't lose those first two games. Right. You know, because we saw, you saw, I mean, I think that game right there was like, this team is good. This is a good football team. These are good players, man. You know, and to go on, that was one of the best atmospheres I've ever played in uh, Kinnick Stadium. You know, they had that the stripe out where it was a, Black, yellow, black, yellow, all around the stadium. I mean, right. it's be better than that. It was a night game, ESPN. I mean, that's that's what you sign up for. Those are the games you want to play in as a player. Um, and, 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 again, do what we did to an Iowa football team who – and I don't care what year it is, whether you're 10-0 right. and 0 or 0-10, you're playing Iowa. That is always a tough game no matter what, whether it's, you know, a down year for a team or not. That Iowa game is always competitive. Um, it's always tough. Iowa so well coached. Um, you know, and, you know, again, I have the most respect, you know, for, for Kirk Ferentz. He actually wrote me a letter after that game, which yeah, you know, wow. I thought was, uh, just yeah, very impressive, you know, again, because, you know, the final score, you know, really wasn't a close game, but again, yeah. to, to take the time and to, to write the letter, um, was just, it shows you the type of man he is, shows you, you know, how great of a program he runs, the type of coach he is. So I, I always appreciated that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was kind of, again, that game was kind of like, yeah, we're, we, you know, you know we, we got a good team here, man. And I was again, happy, happy for the team and, and fans traveled well and to be able to celebrate, you know, with, uh, with friends and family, you know, running off the field into the tunnel after that game. It doesn't yeah. get better than that. Those, those bonds that you develop uh, among teammates are just, uh, you know, among the strongest things you, uh, perhaps ever will develop in your, your lifetime. What, what can you describe uh, just how tight that 2012 team came together and, and how they've continued to be? I mean, are there teammates that you still talk to on a regular basis and maintain contact with them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll talk to guys every now and then, you know, the, uh, the iron lions film, um, that's yep. you know, supposed to be coming out. They had a screening for that at State College. You know, yes. So I had an opp opportunity to see Maudie again, to see Zordich again, uh, to see Jordan Hill uh, again. So it was great to see those guys. And, you know, you, you do your best to keep up with guys through social media as well. Um, but, again, as you mentioned, that 2012 team will, will always have a special bond, you know. And, uh, again, I, I just think it was a different group of guys. It was a tough group of guys that loved the game of football, they love Penn State. Um, you know, again, we love working hard, you know. So, uh, yeah, you know, something about playing college football is that when you show up, when you're 18 years old, you know, and you, you enter this football program with this recruiting class and, you know, you become great friends with these guys over the next, you know, four or five years of your career and of your life. So, uh, I mean, again, I'm, I'm really fortunate to be a part of, you know, of that class to have met such great players and great people. And again, yeah, no doubt, lifelong friends, really. 
<laughs> Matt, you mentioned the the Iron Lions movie, the the greatest eight and four team in the history of college football. I think is the the subtitle to that. And you've referenced this. It, it easily could have been an eleven and one, um, an eleven and one team that year. Um, there were some, I was at the screening that night. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. It, it was it was really well done. Uh, but there there are some you know pieces that I thought were kind of enlightening and and uh, I'll, I'll ask you about that first was the was the conversation between um, between like Maudie and Zordich and those guys who were in the car driving out to Michigan State you know the the turn the car around story which uh, I don't know is a story that a lot of people heard but the biggest takeaway was around around Silas Red. Um, and and kind of the journey that Silas went on. Can you talk a little bit about kind of those two pieces? One, I think, kind of humorous, and one made me look at Silas a lot differently. Well, yeah, when you watch the film, you know, you, you can tell that, uh, you know, he kind of you know, regrets his decision, you know, yeah. to leave the school maybe. Um, and it's, listen, it's, you know, uh, you know, you look back, I'm, I'm 30 years old, I'm going to be 31 years old, you know, when you look back on it now, you know, I mean, he was a kid that, you know, made a decision because he thought it was going to further his career. Um, you know, he thought it was going to be better for him in the long run. And, you know, you can't, you can't blame him for that. He's trying to look out for his future, you know, his, his, you know, future career as a football player. Um, you know, and for us, it was more, you know, I, because he was such a good player and we knew how instrumental he was going to be right. to the success of that team that year. Um, you know, it, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate he decided to leave because I think he could have did some great, great things that year for us. Um, an extremely talented guy, a good person. Yeah. Um, you know, he just, again, he just, listen, he, he made the wrong decision, you know, to, to leave <laughs> right. school, you know, right. it's, no, I mean, it's again, you know, you don't fault him for it. Like I said, because he was trying to do what he thought was best for him and his family at the time. Um, you know, by contrast, Absolutely. it's somebody like yourself then who stuck with it, who did his, his best and kept everybody together. Uh, a, a walk on that wound up uh, with six uh, a career, six total uh, 300 yard passing games, uh, Four of them in that that senior year. Uh, your 395 yards and four touchdowns against Indiana in that uh, season became most by any Penn State quarterback in his senior year. Uh, you, you had the most uh, total yards in the season by a senior. You hold the Penn State record for most uh, completions in a game with those 35 against uh, Northwestern. Uh, you're number four all time on the career passing yardage lists as a walk-on that came to Penn State. But yeah, yeah. You had what it took and you stuck it out. And do you see a parallel between your journey as a walk-on player and that whole team, 2012 team and the, who just refused to uh, listen to what other people thought uh, about them and thought, uh, maybe had much lower expectations than you came, guys came up with. Yeah, you know, uh, again, mentioning that, you know, that senior class, that 2012 class, it was just a bunch of guys, I think that, you know, we all depended on one another and we all didn't want to let one another down. Right. You know, and you talk about, uh, you know, not, not just teammates, but, but great friends. So it wasn't like you were letting a teammate down. You were letting down some of your best friends if you decided to not play or if you decided to leave, you know, it's not, listen, college football, division one football isn't like the NFL. It's not a business where, you know, there's probably, there's some guys inside of an NFL locker room that you don't really talk to. You may just say, Hey, how you doing? Yeah. You know, you know, but like I said, when you play division one football, college football, I mean, these guys become your best friends, you know? So it wasn't like letting a teammate down. It was, you'd be letting down one of your best friends, you know, mm -hmm. and, and guys that, you know, where you showed up to college, you know, as, as a kid who, you know, had, had no idea how to play, you know, big time football or anything like that. And then you grow to be, start to become men over that four or five years. Um, and even, you know, with Craig Fitzgerald or, you know, Bill O'Brien and that staff, you know, they did such a good job of treating us like men. Um, 
you know, and working with us, you know, mm -hmm. at no point in time that I ever feel like, you know, we were looked down on or talked down to, you know, uh, and it just didn't feel like, you know, it just felt like, you know, we were in this whole thing together is what I'm yeah. trying to say, basically, you know, and that everybody was being held accountable. Um, and again, we all accepted our role, big or small, whether you're the starting quarterback or the backup guard, um, you know, everybody accepted the role, um, you know, so, uh, yeah. And that, again, I mentioned it again, you know, a team like that, I don't think, you know, comes around that often. No. So Matt, uh, after your time at Penn state, you spent a number of years in the NFL. Can you take us through, uh, the time when you first kind of joined the NFL and share what your mindset and approach was, was it, was it, did it feel like coming to Penn state your freshman year all over again, you know, trying to prove yourself and, um, yeah. and, and make a spot for yourself. Yeah, it was the same exact thing, right? You know, I was a prefer walking up Penn State, and here I am, an undrafted player in the NFL. But it was kind of similar, similar, uh, similar path that I had to travel. Um, you know, I knew I just knew if I can get into an NFL training camp, get into an NFL OTA, get into an NFL mini camp, that you know I'd be able to make the most of that opportunity, and I can prove that I can, you know, grow and adapt to the NFL style, learn to become a better quarterback, learn how to play the position you know, at the NFL level. And I'm fortunate that I had Bill O'Brien for that for only, yeah. you know, unfortunately for only one season, but yeah. still very fortunate that I had him for that one season because I was able to make the transition fairly smoothly, um, you know, in terms of uh, speaking the same language as NFL coaches and NFL players, you know, kind of understanding the playbook, um, understanding, you know, blitz protections and coverages and, and just kind of the way they did things at an NFL level. And again, just, it wasn't just because Bill O'Brien, um, you know, another guy that I don't think gets a ton, a ton of credit is Charlie Fisher, who was my quarterback coach. Yeah. My fifth and final year, who is a, a great friend of mine. Um, I think he's a fantastic coach. Um, so, you know, he was really able to help me mechanically um, and just kind of make some footwork adjustments, you know, help me prepare for games. So he, he did a fantastic job. Um, so, again, yeah, really lucky to have those coaching from, from Bill and from uh, Charlie Fisher my fifth year. And I think that's one of the reasons why Oakland, when I signed with them was like, you know, this kid understands the game. He knows how to play the position. He's, you know, he's well coached. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think consistency was big for me again, you know, and kind of the ability to take coaching, make corrections and continue to move forward and not make the mistakes you made, you know, at a previous practice or, right. you know, the same mistake you made, uh, at the, at a training camp or a preseason game the week before or whatever it may be, you know, because, you know, that's the difference playing, I mean, in playing quarterback, it's the difference between, you know, starting uh, at Penn state and, and lasting at Penn state or starting the NFL and lasting in the NFL, because how many players you see year after year that get to the NFL and they can't make it, they can't last because they can't make adjustments or even quarterbacks that go to Penn state, you know, that, that have talent, but they can't make it, they can't last because they can't make the adjustments they end up transferring or just quitting football or whatever it may be, you know, but I think, you know, I was able to do that again because of, you know, that, that fifth year I had with, with OB and, uh, and Charlie Fisher. Yeah. And, and once you left Penn state and uh, during the time of your professional career, uh, I think you continue to find support from the Penn state network at various places. <laughs> That you went to and you know it's crazy anywhere anywhere you go it's it's yeah. it's, it's Penn, there's always Penn State people around you know you get the you know we are anywhere right. that you are you know whether I was in Oakland uh, or Kansas City or even my my last stop in the XFL you know had the opportunity to meet uh, some people at uh, an alumni association function in New York City so right. There we go. Yeah, there's a picture yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the Penn State Network and the Penn State family is always supportive, um, is is great. Um, and again, I, you know, I really do consider myself very lucky and fortunate that, you know, I'm, I'm part of that Penn State family. That's indeed. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want to I want to go back to Bill O'Brien and, and give you an opportunity to, to say a little bit more about your relationship with with OB. You know, I, I think as much credit as you give him, uh, I think that people are, you know, it's, it's a story of being at the right place at the right time, not just for, for you, 
but for coach, right? For coach to come from the NFL and have worked with probably one of the greatest quarterbacks uh, in NFL history where he was previously. I'm not going to mention his name because of his college affiliation and because I'm an Eagles fan. Uh, but, uh, but everyone knows who I'm talking about. But uh, in, when he came to Penn State, he probably saw a lot of that veteran, uh, that veteran experience, that veteran leadership that he had at the NFL, that he could then just treat you like he treated uh, the previous quarterbacks that he coached. He put a lot of trust in you. Uh, and I wonder if that's a little bit that, you know, maybe just that was how he coached, right? That was his experience previously. And he found that you could, you could handle that. Uh, and that's why he called the plays that he called because he knew what you were comfortable in. That's why he trusted you to execute on the field the way he did. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think he just saw a guy that was hungry to be coached, a guy that was yeah. hungry to learn, a guy that wanted to become the best quarterback or the best player, you know, that he could be. And listen, everybody has aspirations to play in the NFL, you know, yeah. from you know the time that I was, you know, six or seven years old, you know, playing football in the backyard with my brothers, you know, pretending that I was Troy Aikman or Brett Favre or something like that, right? Everybody dreams of playing in the NFL, but, you know, when you get to the Division One level, I mean, in Penn State, it's the last thing you think about. You know, you want to have a successful career. You want to win games. You want to become a great quarterback. And that fifth and final year for me, I didn't think about the NFL or anything like anything like that. I just wanted to be a really good player. And I wanted to leave Penn State on a high note because I felt like I hadn't had the opportunity in years prior to do that. And I knew the yeah. type of player I can be. Um, so again, I made the most of it. I mean, I had this NFL coach now in my head coach who had just, you know, coached Tom Brady and, you know, played in the Super Bowl. Um, so, I mean, I, I did my best to try to be like a sponge and just, <laughs> you know, learn as much as I could and soak in everything that I could, um, you know, and, and, and you mentioned him calling plays and kind of trusting me with the offense, you know, uh, what I always appreciated that, that Bill did was that, um, you know, he, again, and I talked a little bit about it earlier is that he called plays I wanted. He didn't call yeah. plays just to call plays. Like he wasn't saying, listen, Matt, we got to run this play because it's part of the offense. You know, if I don't like a play, he wasn't calling it which that's, I think, how you have successful offenses. And that's how you put your quarterbacks and your players in positions to do well, is that if a player doesn't like a player, he's not comfortable or the play's not working, you know, he's not going to call it. You know, I, I felt like so many times he's just called the same play because we were good at it. And, you know, we ran it well, you know, and it's just, he didn't complicate things for us. Uh, you know, um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, it's just, uh, Again, you know, wish I wish I had got, got a chance to play for Bill for another year. But uh, again, yeah. very, very fortunate I had that one year with him. Yeah, another year would have really been super in yeah. your, your preparation. Do you still have contact with him at all, <laughs> uh, Bill? Uh, so I hadn't uh, – I, I played for the Houston Texans for like a week when he was head <laughs> coach there. But right. I, hadn't, I hadn't talked to him since that, which was probably – what was it 2017? But I actually I talked to him two weeks ago. Uh, right. We talked on the phone for about a half hour, you know, which it was great catching up with him. We talked a lot about that 2012 team, um, you know, talk, you know, talked about our families. Just you know, it was great to catch up. It, you know, it really was. Um, but uh, but yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you worked uh, with uh, the Penn State football team last year as a sideline uh, reporter and sharing insight uh, leading up to each game and co-hosting a, a post-game show. How did you get involved in that role and, and uh, what your, your, your experience at Penn State, uh, how did that uh, prepare you? Well, wow, working with my boys, uh, Jack Ham and uh, Steve Jones. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great, great people. Love those guys. Um, sorry that I'm not there this year, you know, just an uh, unfortunate year, you know, for, uh, for everybody dealing with COVID. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I went to Penn State's media day and I graduated in broadcast journalism. Um, so, and uh, the XFL uh, was, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about playing in the XFL, wasn't sure, was going to kind of wait and see, you know, um, but then they offered me, they were like, hey, listen, you know, do you want to, and again, I was at Penn State's media day. And then after that, they'd offered me to be a part of the, uh, the post-game show that they did on Facebook Live. 
So I was like, yeah, you know, great. I don't have much going on right now. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to play in the XFL or not. I wasn't sure if I wanted to yet or not. Um, but then like a couple of days before the first game of the season, they're like, Hey, do you want to do sideline radio too? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I was like, sure. You know, I was going to be there anyways, you know? Right. So, uh, well, it was awesome. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, again, working with Steve and Jack was, was awesome. I learned a lot from those guys, um, kind of being on the field and seeing the kind of game from, you know, that perspective and that point of view, uh, was a lot of fun. Um, because I never had a chance to kind of just stand there and watch a game. You know, I was always, always playing, you know, definitely still miss playing, but you know, I was able to watch the game a little bit, little bit differently, um, which, uh, which was nice. Sure. Matt, we got a couple questions coming in from some of our guests today. Uh, again, a shout out to your parents, uh, classy people. This is from Paul McConaughey. He had the chance to sit with your, your mom and dad at the, uh, quarterback club one time he wants to know how they're doing thank you so much they're, they're doing fantastic uh yeah I'll, I'll, I'll tell i'll tell them you're asking you know they, they love penn state football um you know i wish they went they, they they go to games every now and then i wish they went to every game uh but uh, but yeah they you know they they watch penn state every week um you know they love penn state so i'll, I'll tell them what was the name paul what was the name mcconaughey paul mcconaughey, paul McConaughey. yeah, yeah. McConaughey. I'll tell my parents you were asking. Thanks so much. <laughs> so uh, here's another question from Justin Lee. Uh, and again, this is a family show, Matt. I'm just going to remind you this. But his question is, just a few days ago, he watched your post-game press conference when we got robbed in the Nebraska game, uh, when they didn't give Lehman the touchdown. You said, we'll never get that call. We all know what you were talking about. But now nearly a decade later, let it rip. Tell us what you really <laughs> wanted to say that day. <laughs> Jeez. I think I was banned from the media that week too. I don't think that, I don't think our communications department let me talk to the media. Uh, listen, obviously I'm an emotional guy when it comes to the game of football, you know, I think, but I, Hey, I think that's the way you should be. You know, it's an emotional game um, that, that, that you play. Um, you put so much time and effort and energy into it um, that, uh, you know, when you lose games, it's frustrating, you know, because you, again, I'm so competitive. I just, I want to win, you know, and I want Penn, I wanted Penn state to win and I wanted us to succeed and I want us, us to prove everyone wrong, you know, um, you can watch, you know, you can watch the clip over and over again, man. It's clearly a touchdown. Like right. again, yeah. and you look at where we were, we were in Nebraska, right. you know, we're not going to get that call. We're just not. I think you know what that means. Like we're at that time, at that point where we were as a program, uh, you know, Penn State football, you know, it was yeah. a close call, you know, but we're not going to get it. We yeah. weren't not, we weren't going to get that call. <laughs> you know what it means. I, we weren't gonna understood. Get it. I under, understood. I'm getting, not, I'm getting uh, fired up now talking about I it. I know. I know. We're, we're going to bring it down a notch here. Um, <laughs> Uh, alumni and fans are interested to hear about what you're up to now. We see you're active on social media. I mentioned the podcast. Uh, share a little bit of details what you're focused on right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ex uh, obviously, you know, the XFL uh, ended after the fifth week of the season, I think. Um, you know, and for me, again, it was just another opportunity for me to try to get back to the NFL. That, that was the goal with playing in the XFL. Um, fortunately, didn't things didn't work out, you know, so, um, but again, I appreciate the opportunity the XFL and, and the New York guardians gave me. I thought it was, I thought it was great. I think a spring league like that can work for players, yeah. um, you know, to help kids that are coming out of college who maybe aren't ready to play in the NFL yet, who just need a year to develop and learn how to be a pro and get some experience. Uh, so I think it's great, you know, and hopefully, you know, the XFL when it kicks off and what's it 2022 now, um, you know, hopefully it, 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 they do everything right. Um, and it's successful again, because I think it can work. Um, but yeah, for now, I mean, again, I mentioned earlier, I was in broadcast journalism. That was what I majored in at Penn state. So I knew once my career was over, that's always something I wanted to get into. You know, I, like I love football. I love talking football. I love being around football. Uh, so, you know, I knew I always wanted to pursue and, and, and give being a broadcaster a chance, being an analyst a chance, you know, working, you know, for the radio. I wanted to, you know, give that a chance and see if I liked it. Um, you know, I mean, again, love watching football, love breaking football down, love talking football. I, I do a podcast now. Um, you know, we talk football, you know, we, we have, we try to have some fun with the show. 
So, uh, you know, I mean, that's it right now. Like my, my wife, my wife and I, we have a 21 month old baby boy. So ch chasing him around the house all day. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, again, I'm working for, uh, Sirius XM, you know, he's paying you big 10 radio working from home doing that, which is nice. It's, you know, it's, it's nice to be home. Um, you know, nice, nice to be around family. And we love, and we love being around great Penn Staters like you, Matt. Thanks. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great. Hey, Matt, uh, that's all the time that we have today, but thank you so much for joining us on Football Letter Live. You know, uh, as our alma mater says, uh, may our lives swell thy fame, and certainly you have brought a lot of fame and a lot of glory back to Happy Valley, and for that, we're truly grateful. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, guys. Anytime. Thanks. So, John, that's all the time that we have this afternoon. What? what it was great to catch up with Matt. I mean, he's just... What a great guy and what a great leader. And he just, he just had that drive that he wouldn't give up. Absolutely. And you can tell he's ready to get, I mean, he's ready to put the pads right back on. I mean, you just have yeah. to ask him a question about that Nebraska game. He's yeah. ready to go. <laughs> so brought, we, out, brought out the spirit in him. Absolutely. Absolutely. We hope that you'll join us next week on Football Letter Live back in our regular time slot Thursday evenings at 8 when we'll welcome Letterman Paris Palmer to the show. Also on the schedule next week is our virtual speaker series highlights the Applied Research Lab at Penn State. That discussion is set for noon on Tuesday and then Wednesday morning. I'll be talking with Jay Paterno during coffee hour. Jay has a new book out and we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's a, it's a fiction that he wrote about uh, the life of a college football coach. Uh, while he has dubbed it a fiction, I am sure that there are a lot of elements of, of truth and, and a lot of elements of, uh, of nonfiction into it. So we look forward to talking about his book. These and other programs can be found on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. If you're a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member, go out to our website today and join and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thank you to our guests, John Black. Thank you to you. Happy Thanksgiving to you. I hope you and your family have a chance to uh, have a wonderful holiday together. Thank you very much. It's... And thanks to everyone else for joining us for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are... Penn State.